title of the message tonight is The Suffering of Our Savior. The Suffering of Our Savior. Now, of course, this is a psalm that was penned centuries before Christ would walk the earth. However, it was, of course, penned by David and, and the prophetic, uh, the prophetic um, implications of this psalm is, is incredible. And, and just how, uh, almost to an uh, exact description, the cross and the scene there is described. Now, you know, we, we sung tonight about the victory that we have in Christ and how we are now uh, in Christ and, and we have the hope of heaven and how, uh, you know, he paid the penalty for our sin and conquered death, hell, and the grave. And, and tonight, I just wanted to take a few minutes to, to, to remind us of the, the, the immense price that Christ paid for us, the suffering that he our Savior endured. Now, of course, as I mentioned a moment ago, David is pinning this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and and he experienced times in his life of great uh, persecution, of great despair, where it seemed like God had left him. And but I want you to understand that God was directing David in this psalm, and and he deliberately chose. Uh, to give David these words. And I want you to understand that about the scriptures. The Bible says this, that in first Peter, that, uh, that the scriptures were given when holy men of God spake as the spirit moved. And um, they were like a pen or an instrument in the hand of living God. And it's amazing. Our Bible and just the personality of the men were not, was not removed and the distinction uh, of their time period, their, 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 uh, their method of, of, of writing. And, but, but God, of course, inspires scripture. We believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so uh, this is no different here in Psalm 22. And David, as he is penning this psalm, he first prophesies, I believe, the agony of our Savior. The agony of our Savior. Can we turn me down a little bit? It's a little, a little hot tonight. The agony of our Savior. Look at verse number one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning. I want you to notice, first of all, in the suffering of our Savior and, and the agony that he ex- experienced on the cross He experienced so because fellowship was broken. For the first time in the history of all time, Jesus was not in fellowship with the Father. He he begins this psalm, of course, David saying, my God, my God. And of course, the second repetition of this plea, it shows the intensity of his agony. And of course, it, it, it begs to to show that there was a relationship there, that uh, he truly had a relationship with God, David was expressing. Of course, we know this to be true uh, more so than from any person than, than the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus had union with the Father. He had fellowship with the Father from eternity past. And, and, and on the cross was the only time in history where that fellowship had been broken. Jesus was now experienced something that he had never experienced, separation from God. You see, Jesus in his life, he had known great pain. He had known suffering. He had known both physical and emotional uh, distress. However, he had not ever experienced separation or alienation from God the Father. But on the cross, That fellowship was broken. The sun refused to shine. And and when God turned his face away from Jesus for the first time, and, you know, often our kids like to stray a little far in stores and, and, you know, they get lost sometimes. And I remember one time in particular, I was with my son and and, uh, he was about four or so and and he, he, he was just getting a little antsy and he got away from us, and I, I could see him, but he couldn't see me, and I hid myself for a while. 
Mama wasn't there. She wouldn't have gone for that. <laughs> and um, I saw the panic and the distress set in when he couldn't see, see me. I, I saw him, and then finally, he, he came around the corner, and I, I had seen him suffer enough. I, see, I seen enough of the distress on his face, and I stepped out and said, hey, don't stray away from me. Stay close to me. <laughs> and, uh, but I can only imagine there's no comparison to what Jesus is experiencing here, this agony of being separated from the Father for the first time in history. Jesus, he, 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 uh, he felt every second of that. Uh, and when he goes on, he says, uh, why have you forsaken me? Forsaken. We know that Jesus was forsaken so that we could be accepted. Why have you turned away from me? Why are you not hearing my cry? Uh, is what David penned here. And this is, of course, what Jesus said while on the cross. And I would, I would encourage every Christian to study the, the, the seven sayings, I believe there were, from the cross. What Jesus uttered from the cross and, and the significance of every one of them because they point to uh, the sacrifice of Jesus on that cross. We don't quite understand all that Jesus was going through on that cross. It was so complex, so dark, so mysterious at that moment uh, beyond emotional comprehension. Can you imagine? Uh, we can't quite comprehend what Jesus was bearing on that cross. He bore the sin of the world, the darkest, depraved, uh, the, the deepest, worst sin you can think about was embodied in Jesus. Jesus, uh, who knew no sin, became sin for you and I. He didn't become a sinner. He never sinned, never would, but he took on sin and he bore that. And because he, had, he was carrying that sin, God could not look on him. God could not come to him. The father could not, uh, could not bear to see him in that way. So he looked the other way. He forsook him for that time period. Spurgeon said this, Jesus not only endured the withdrawal of the father's fellowship, but also the actual outpouring of the father's wrath upon him. The entire wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. We don't like to talk about a wrathful God, but if you want to know what God thinks about sin and how he, what he truly feels when he sees sin and, and those who indulge and those who uh, willfully reject him, oh, just look at the cross. You know, we, we beautify the cross in our culture, but it was, a, it was a mutilating, excruciating, humiliating death. And Jesus is in agony as he, for the first time, was not in fellowship with the Father, and he felt forsaken. And he says, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, verse 2, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and, and I am not silent. And he, he talks about how he cries out to God, but God is not hearing it. He's not responding. Responding uh, to uh, his cries, and you understand this, and and one reason why I truly believe the Bible to be the Word of God is because it, it doesn't even cover up some of the things that people would say about Jesus that would maybe uh, maybe paint him as weak, even though we know he's not weak. You remember when he was in the garden and he said, "Father, if it be possible, will you take this cup from me?" That was his humanity. Jesus was 100% God, but he was 100% man. And he understood the suffering that lay before him. And it was so heavy on him. We know that he sweat great drops of blood. He said, Father, if you can, is there any other way? Can you take this cup from me? And he went, and I believe the father was it's sad to say, no, son, there, there is no other way. And he went back again, and he asked the same question. And his response, I believe, was the same. And he said, nevertheless, 
not my will, but thine be done. And the Bible says this about God the Father in Isaiah 53. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, and he shall see his seed. This is beyond my comprehension. I wouldn't offer my son for any of you in this room. (laughs) I would not want to allow my son to suffer for anybody in this room. But God said, the word says that God, the father, was pleased to afflict him. That he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It was always the plan. This wasn't wasn't plan B. When God created man, he knew men would fall. He knew that sin would come into the world. And he knew that the only sacrifice acceptable would be his only son. So Jesus is, is, is... is declaring, or David, of course, under the inspiration of God, is, is giving insight to that, that agony that the Savior would experience, feeling forsaken or feeling forgotten. And he goes on to talk about God's faithfulness, that he's holy and enthroned in the praises. Verse number three, he says, our, father, our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. He's talking to them about others who had cried out to God and who had been delivered, but this would not be the case for Jesus. He says, verse 6, but I am a worm and no man. Jesus is saying uh, on the cross, as he uh, is expressing this, of course, uh, prophetically, he's saying, I feel abandoned by the Father. I feel forsaken by the Father. And I, my groanings and my cries went unanswered. And, and uh, could you imagine uh, Jesus on that cross for six hours, naked, spitted upon, his, his beard had been plucked, a uh, crown of thorns on his head. He had already been scourged by a cat of nine tails. And can you imagine just the, uh, the agony, uh, the, the physical and, and emotional and spiritual agony. And so as he cries out to the Father, he says, I am a worm. I'm the most insignificant of creatures on the earth. Less than a man is what he was saying. And the reproach of men and despised by the people, the agony of our Savior, this unmatched, there's no one who had ever and who will ever experience what Christ uh, experienced on that cross to save us, y'all. I had a professor in, in seminary, and he said, every day I read the, the, crucifix, the, the crucifixion account in the Gospels, I, I want to never get over what Jesus has done for me, is what he said. And that stuck with me. You know, sometimes we hear it over and over and over again, and we just get uh, just comfortable with it. But the Bible says about Jesus and his suffering on the cross that there was no man whose visage, his his face and his image was no man had ever been marred like Jesus. Oh, he was hard to recognize as a human. The agony of our Savior. But I want you to see not only the agony tonight, I want you to see the antagonist of the Savior Look at verse number seven. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their heads saying he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. We see that Jesus on the cross, he was antagonized. He was verbally abused by those who walked by. I want you to understand that it was a spectacle. They would go outside of the city but they would go uh, towards a main, uh, a main vein into the city. And so people would walk by those being crucified. And they'd see their crimes on the top of their cross. And I want you to understand that these crosses were not six feet in the air. They were not uh, very high up. They were almost to eye level. And so as they would walk by, they, they, they could say something to the person on the cross. And, 
And, and um, they could uh, hurl their, their ridicule. And this is what they did to Jesus. He said, he saved, you save others, why don't you save yourself? And we know the thief that was there, one of them, he said, oh, 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 if you are who you say you are, why don't you get us down from here? And the ridicule, could you imagine? Jesus heard every word of that, uh, but the Bible says he was like a, 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 a lamb dumb to the slaughter. He did not respond to any of those. He, 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 he soaked in that ridicule. He was treated how uh, we deserved uh, so that we could be treated how Jesus deserves to be treated. And it says that they shot at the lip, the sharp words that they spoke to Jesus. Oh, they, they would have cut deep. Uh, they would have uh, said the most uh, vile things they would have said the most hurtful things and it's funny we live in a culture today where there there seems to be no more decency in words and we look for ways to tear people down and there's so much polarization in our in our nation right now where uh, everyone is in on a different side of an argument from you is an is an enemy but I want you to understand that these people uh who had Jesus crucified they hated Jesus and they they took the opportunity to shoot at the lips sharp words at Jesus as he was in his lowest time. How many of you have been there? You're, you're down and out and someone's beating you up while you're down. God forbid we be like that, Christians. We're the only group of people who shoot, who, who kill our wounded. Oh, did you hear what so-and-so did? Uh, Oh, we try to mask it up like, oh, it's a, it's a prayer request. Why don't you pray for so-and-so? His, his, his wife, is, his, she left him and because of this and this. And you go on and fill in the blank. And, but Jesus, he experienced this type of verbal abuse and ridicule on the cross. But I want to see not only was it verbal, it was physical. I, I touched on this already a little bit. Jesus, he, he's surrounded by those who hate him. Look at verse number 12. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. Now, who was present, I believe, the day of the cross? And I believe the priests, the Pharisees, the elders, the rulers, the captains, the Roman soldiers. We know the Roman soldiers, they, they mocked Jesus and they, they got in a circle and they put a, a, a bag over Jesus' head and they struck him. These strong soldiers hit him, hit him and said, who, tell us if you are, who hit you? Prophesy who hit you. Jesus' face was swollen, bloodied. His beard was plucked out and, and, and it was just a vicious assault. When these bulls surrounded him, everywhere he looked, um, you know, there were his, his enemies and those who hated him. And could you imagine that? It's unlike anything else anyone's experienced. And he goes on, he says, I, I, I'm, I'm poured out like water. Jesus was complete, completely emptied out for us. Completely. I believe every drop of his blood was shed for us. Do you know the new glorified body in heaven um, is just flesh and bone? There's no blood. And I believe because Jesus shed every ounce of his blood for us, for our redemption. And he goes on, he says, our, my bones are out of joint. You know, when they would take that, that person who's being crucified and they would, they'd get that cross into the hole that was pre-dugged and, and, and to... They would slam that cross down into, could you imagine the nails through his hands and his feet? And as he came down, it dislocated both of his shoulders, no doubt. And other bones, I believe. His bones were out of joint. And to add insult to the already injury, he, he was dealing with the pain of that. His heart, he said, was like wax melted within him. His heart, we know it. Some say Jesus died of a broken heart, but 
It had gotten to the point, of course, when the Roman soldier came and took the spear and hit his side with the spear. Out came water and blood around his heart. His heart was completely broken. And the Bible says, verse 15, uh, that his strength had dried up and his tongue, his mouth was completely dry. We know he said from the cross, I thirst. And they tried to give him vinegar on a sponge and he refused it. And he said, um, I'm near death in verse 15. I, I, I'm I'm near death. The dust of death, they have, they have brought me to this. And, and I want you to understand, Jesus went through all of that for us. Verse 16, uh, it prophesied, of course, the way Jesus would die, that he would be pierced, his hands and his feet. This is, this is centuries before crucifixion was invented. All of his bones were exposed I believe that was from the scourging. That scourge would rip off flesh every time it would hit him. And he was scourged by the Romans, not by the Jews. The Romans didn't have a limit how many times they could hit someone. The Jews only would do so 39 times. We know Paul went through that a few times. But who knows how many times they hit Jesus. So I believe you could see his rib cage. I believe you could see bones in him. It was to that gruesome degree that our Savior was tortured. He said, they all look at me, they, all, they stare at me, and he's exposed. And What a Savior. In verse 18, he says, they divide my garments among them. This is what took place, right? The Roman soldiers, they ripped up his garment. It would have been a seamless garment. It would have been a, 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 a long type robe, and they would have ripped that thing up, and they, they, they would cast lots um, for a piece of Jesus' garment. And this is all, of course, prophetic. This is the scene at the cross, 2AT, penned by David, who is, of course, the, the root who is, uh, you know, David is the, the grand, the, well, he's in the lineage of Jesus. Jesus is from his line. And, and so, but Jesus is called the root and the branch of David. And, and um, but yeah, he describes to a T the suffering of our Savior. And I just want us tonight to just sit in that for a moment. Just, just think of what our Lord has done, what he, what he suffered so that we could be set free. And let that change our perspective and how we live for him. If he's gone through that for us, what is it that he could ever ask us to do or to be that is too much? There's nothing. So tonight we, we, we see the suffering of our Savior. The cross, though an instrument of death and torture and shame, For us, it is a symbol of our freedom because of our Savior who went to it for us. And aren't you thankful for that tonight? You know, I've learned that the ground is level at the cross. And if you haven't come to the cross yet for your salvation, oh, tonight would be a great night to turn to Jesus. You see, religion can't save you. Only a relationship with Jesus I had the privilege of teaching men's study last night. We were in Romans 10, and, and I love that chapter, of course, because it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's really simple. You must just confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. Tonight, if you don't know Christ, you can call on his name and he'll save you. And tonight, if you are in Christ, remember what Jesus did for our redemption so that we can be accepted. He was forsaken so that we could be accepted. 
He paid the penalty for our sin. 